All right. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining me this morning here on this talk in uh, DevOps UK on streamlining large-scale Java developments using Error Pro. Uh, my name is Sander Mack. I'm from the Netherlands, as you might have already guessed from this uh, picture here of the beautiful Amsterdam canals. Uh, and I work with uh, Picnic, and we're an online groceries scale-up in the Netherlands. I'll tell a bit more about that later, um, but suffice to say, uh, we do write a lot of Java, uh, Java code being a scale-up. And uh, that is also uh, going to be the topic of this course, how we tackle that. But first, I'm going to let you in on a little secret of conference speakers. I would say a dirty little secret. Because we love to talk about new stuff, right? New frameworks, new languages, new architectures. And that's great. And I've seen a lot of this around here at, uh, at DevOps as well. But the question is, what can you really take away from that, right? Tomorrow in your teams. And what can you actually do with the knowledge that you get? And I think the cool thing about this talk is that I'm going to teach you a superpower, and yes, Java developers can have superpowers, that you can actually apply tomorrow already in your teams, in any Java code base, I would say. And uh, I think uh, that makes this talk very practical. Uh, hopefully, uh, it will inspire you to at least think about applying the tools and the technologies that we talk about. Uh, and uh, I think the hurdle to to using this uh, this kind of tooling is uh, I would say a bit less low uh, a bit lower than just adopting a new framework a new language a new architecture etc so anyway what is this superpower I'm going to talk about and I'm going to teach you well that is the ability to in uh, in an effective way refactor your code bases at scale and no I'm not talking about hundreds of developers frantically using IDE shortcuts in an antenna J Yes, that's a great tool, and yes, you should refactor. I'm not going to convince you here. I hope you are aware of all the benefits of doing refactoring. Um, but we want to do this at scale, which means we need to do it through code. We need to automate, right? That is the solution to any problem uh, where you want to scale. So we do this at Picnic using a tool called Error Pro. And we did not create this. This is a tool that is open sourced by Google. Um, they also have uh, a few uh, millions or maybe even billions of lines of uh, Java code lying around. So obviously they have a need to refactor and incrementally improve their code bases using this kind of tooling. And the cool thing about Error is that it has been open source. You can use it freely. Um, the downside is it's not that well known yet in the Java community, and I'm here to fix that, right? So you will all have no excuse anymore after this talk, and you will be uh, able to actually apply this in your own co code bases. Before we get into the tool, a little bit of context on why we use this and what it is that we do at Picnic. So we want to tackle what we call the online groceries challenge, meaning that we want to make it fun, easy, and affordable for people to do their online uh, to do their gro weekly groceries online. Um, so people, uh, they can use our app, they place an order, and then next day or later, you get it delivered using these cute uh, vehicles that you saw in the opening slide. And um, we don't just have the app, but we own the whole supply chain. So we have our own warehouses, we have our own vehicles. So you can imagine there's a lot of software to be written to manage this process, not just the apps and the backends that goes with it, but also all the planning processes, purchase order processes, um, and so on and so forth. Which means that uh, even though uh, we're a relatively young company, uh, started in 2015, we already have many, many systems to operate and to, uh, to code with. Just to give you a little bit of a glimpse, um, like I said, we started in 2015, so seven years old as a company. We've grown from a handful of people who started the company, uh, of course, wrote a monolith at that point, which is the right thing to do when you start out and you don't know what your market is and what your product is going to be. Uh, but by now, we're 200 engineers and we are running many, many services. And these services are predominantly Java-based. Uh, we do have a few other things in our tech stack as well, but the majority is uh, indeed written using Java. And we're talking about millions of Lines, millions of lines of code by now. So that effectively means if you want to keep scaling this way, then you need to really, really care about your code quality because you cannot go from five to 10 to 50 to 100 to 200 people in the span of seven years without being very deliberate about how you evolve your code base and how you maintain the quality. And that's why, uh, not from the very beginning, but almost from the very beginning, tools uh, like these have been used to actually increase the quality of our code base and to be able to do this uh, at the scale that we're at uh, right now. Now, when you think about code quality, people often think about SonarCube. And that's a great tool, don't get me wrong. But is it really helping you in your day-to-day -day development activities to actually make your code better? 
What I see a lot is the sort of broken window theory in action with Sonocube, where people, well, they run it maybe nightly and they look at it maybe weekly or monthly, if at all. And then they see, okay, well, um, I have 30 days of technical depth. What does that mean, right? Oh, it has increased to 35 days. What does that mean? Do I need to do something? Are all these rules actually tweaked? What do they mean? Um, that is something that does not really help you improve your code base. It does give you insight. It's a great tool to get insight. It's a great tool to get trends, but it's not a great tool to actually steer developers in their day-to-day -day work towards better code. However, there are more tools, of course. So again, Sonocube is not a bad tool. It's great to get insights. It's great to see trends, but there are other tools in the Java space that are a bit closer to your development cycle that you can um, use in your IDEs and your build tools. And Spotbugs, for example, and CheckStyle are another example of, of these kind of tools. But still, these tools, they only yell at you, right? If you do it wrong. They say, okay, you, uh, you have violated this bug pattern or you've done this wrong which is great, um, but at the same time, it also makes you wonder if the tool can see that something wrong, why can it not help me to fix it? And this is where error prone, together with another project called Refaster, comes in. So you go from analyzing and understanding your code with Sonocube towards preventing your code base from regressing and, and getting worse and introducing new bugs or new uh, patterns uh, with spot bugs and check style towards a tool that actually helps you refactor and rewrite your code, uh, and not just according to pre-existing patterns, but also according to your own coding patterns and your own checks. But we'll see more on that later. So to be sure, um, we use all of these tools, right? It's not either or. But in the end, uh, error prone gives us the most leverage in terms of being able to encode our own patterns and our own rules and, and things that we think that make up a quality code base um, uh, and, and automate that. So what is Aeroprom? It is essentially a Java compiler plugin. Wait, can the compiler, the Java compiler have plugins? Yes, it can. Not a very widely known uh, feature, but this is a perfect use case because Aeroprom, because it needs to look at your code, needs to hook in at some point. And the compiler is one of the best places to hook into code and to do analysis. Um, it also means, being a compiler plugin, that you can effectively use it in any kind of situation, right? Regardless of what kind of build tool you use. If it's Gradle, Bazel, uh, Maven, doesn't really matter. You don't need specific uh, build tool plugins. You can just conf uh, configure this as a compiler plugin, a standardized compiler plugin in Java, and then you will get all the functionality of error prone out of the box. Speaking of functionality out of the box, error prone contains a lot of bug patterns that it will check for you. And these are, I mean, there are hundreds of these and they're all uh, autom uh, automatically available as, uh, as you enable the compiler plugin. And um, by default, this also already gives you a very good uh, set of rules and checks that are applied to your code bases to help increase the code quality. But this is still pretty similar to what Spotbugs, for example, also does, right? Um, so we'll see uh, that you can uh, st take steps beyond that as well. The cool thing about uh, error prone is that it supports um, both Java 8 and 11 and also Java 17, which for us was also quite important as we migrated to Java 17 uh, roughly a quarter after it was, re was released. So for us, it's really important uh, yeah, that a tool uh, keeps up with the Java ecosystem and helps us uh, move, uh, move uh, quickly. So if you go to the error prone site, you'll find this uh, testimonial by Doug Lee, who is the guy who wrote the Java util concurrent libraries. And he says, well, it's a bit embarrassing. I guess I'm back to liking error prone um, and because it found a bug in his concurrent hash map implementation, um, even though it sometimes annoys me. And I think uh, that is sort of a sentiment that we can all recognize, right? That, I mean, we know these tools are good for us, but it's still annoying if you see these errors and you get caught in, the, in something that uh, you actually shouldn't do. But still, um, this, uh, this uh, already shows that uh, it's not just a toy tool, it is a ser serious tool that can uh, find serious issues in, uh, in serious code. So instead of talking uh, a lot more about AirPro, I thought I would just give you guys a demo. So let's switch to the IDE. And here I have a very, very simple Java class. Um, as you can see, it prints something, looks at the uh, first argument, and uh, uh, there's there's nothing really special here going on, uh, but there are some issues with the co this code. Uh, anyone see something wrong here? Or is it still too early? Still waking up, getting your coffees? 
might get a no pointer. Uh, why? For the arcs here, uh, yeah, well, we, but we do check the length of the uh, arcs uh, array, right? So, so that uh, is not the issue here. Anyone else see something? There's an empty method, not ideal, but also not strictly wrong. Uh, but we'll do something about that, indeed. But there's uh, something else here that we're uh, we want. Exactly, there's no throw, right? So it just says new illegal argument exception. But funny thing is, this is perfectly legal Java code, of course, right? So if we say Maven clean verify, it will just compile and nothing happens. That is until we enable error prone. So let's do that. Let's make sure that we go to our uh, plugin configuration of the Maven compiler plugin, and we're going to add the compiler arguments to enable uh, error prone. So for that, we need a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we need to enable error prone as a compiler plugin. Again, this is a, a standard functionality of the Java compiler. Um, and for this to work, you also need to add the error prone core dependency to your annotation processor path. That is where the plugin will be loaded from. And uh, finally, uh, you also need to uh, specify this compile policy where it says, okay, um, we work with uh, simplified ASTs. Currently, uh, this is something that uh, is necessary. There's a JDK bug uh, open to fix this, so that is no longer necessary, but for now, you will need this. Um, so that is, that is it. If you uh, actually enable error prone in this way and you run the same build again, then you will see that there's a actual compiler error, right? So error prone as a compiler plugin, analyzed the code, saw that there was a throws uh, missing here, and it throws a compiler error in this case. And it says, okay, uh, I found a dead exception, which is the name or the identifier of this, uh, this error, where an exception is created but not thrown. And then you can go to the error prone site if you want to for more details. But the really interesting thing is that it also has a suggestion for you. So it's not just saying you did something wrong, please fix it. It also gives you the suggestion here. It says that you actually mean throw new illegal argument exception on this line. Why? Well, yeah, that's actually what we want to have here. But it also makes you think, if it actually knows the solution, how about you fix it for me, error pro? Well, that's also possible. Let's see and find out how. If we now go to, to the configuration of uh, error prone again, and we configure it to uh, work in patching mode rather than in checking mode, we can provide the checks that we want uh, error prone to patch our code for, uh, which in this case is the dead exception check, but you can also enable uh, more of those. And uh, we need to give error prone, the compiler plugin, the location where it should output a patch or a diff. But in this case, I'm going to say, just patch it in place because, well, this is a demo and that's uh, the most effective way to show things. And by doing this, we can run the build again. There we go. It succeeds, as you can see, so there's no more compiler error. And ta-da, there's throw a new illegal argument exception. Pretty cool, right? So taking a step back, we enabled error prone as a compiler plugin. It has many default built-in checks for anti-patterns. It found one. It gave us a very nice contextualized suggestion. And effectively, by switching it from checking mode to patching mode, it actually fixes the code for us. I think that's really, really pretty cool and pretty powerful. And as said, there are many, many more checks that are enabled and, and uh, 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 out of the box if you uh, start using error prone itself. So it's a little bit, in this way, uh, an autocorrect for your code. It has the combined wisdom of many, many people uh, that are captured in these checks that are implemented in error prone, and it can actually rewrite the code for you without you having to do anything. So. Is it just about these kind of core Java patterns that you can match? Um, no, actually in stock error prone, there are also pretty specific bug patterns for libraries and other environments than just core Java. So the one that we saw was really a core Java pattern, right? Where we uh, had a missing throws, but there's also Android specific checks. There is a set of checks that applies to uh, the JUnit testing library where error prone actually analyzes the code and finds out uh, specific uh, anti-patterns in there. There's uh, one for Joda time, which is by now a bit outdated of course, but it gives you already a picture of that this is not just about core Java, but it's about <coughs> taking a useful set of, of libraries and patterns and giving you the opportunity to check for those and actually rewrite code also based on these patterns. So, with that being said, um, 
if you start using error prone, like I said, tomorrow and you uh, apply it, then you will probably find out that there are quite a, quite a few errors or warnings already in your code base. Um, and it might not be that you want to have all of them enabled from the very, very start because it would require, to, you, know, require you to do a lot of uh, vetting and checking, etc. So you can be more specific about what checks should be enabled at what level uh, using the XEP flags, which I already showed a little bit in the uh, compiler configuration. So in our example, we could, uh, uh, could say for a specific check, instead of making it a compiler error, make it a warning. Um, you can turn uh, certain checks on or off. So for example, we turn all the Android uh, checks off because, well, we don't apply this to Android code bases, just to backend Spring Boot uh, code bases. So no, uh, so no, no, no need to waste any CPU cycles by doing these Android checks. And th that is all possible. And the cool thing about this being hooked into the compiler infrastructure is that you can also use the, the regular express warnings um, uh, annotation to, in the code at certain places, suppress these checks uh, on a case-by-case on a -case basis. Right, so if you don't want to uh, disable it for all code, but just in specific spots where you say, okay, here I accept this, this anti pattern or the bug pattern to appear for now or maybe for forever because it's a deliberate choice, you can do that using the add suppress warnings uh, exception here. So if I were to put add suppress warnings that exception on this main method that we just saw and I would run it in checking mode, it would not give this compiler error. All right, I've been talking a lot about anti-patterns and then bug patterns that error-prone can check for um, and that, that it can rewrite. Uh, but there's also some other use cases that you can uh, use error-prone for. And I want, want to hi highlight one of those, uh, which is the uh, var check and the var annotation that you can use. Now, you probably all have this annoying coworker in your team who says, we should make everything immutable, right? Immutability is great. Um, it makes you, um, it gives you the ability to reason much better about code, uh, safer in concurrency, etc., etc. And you know it's true, but at the same time, adding final everywhere is super annoying, right? It's, it gives a lot of noise in your code. Um, so that the, the cost-benefit analysis is not always clear there. So what you can do with error prone it being a compiler plugin and being very, very involved in the uh, compilation phase of Java, is actually flip the defaults around of Java, where you say, okay, if this is enabled, um, then we assume that all variables, all local variables, all parameters, etc., are final. And if you do want to reassign to a variable, it needs to be annotated with var. And I think it's a pretty, pretty nice way to flip the defaults and make sure that you are working towards more immutability in your code, um, while at the same time not polluting your code base with all kind of final keywords. Um, so we use this, uh, and yes, we do have a couple of places in these million lines of code where we use var, but in general, uh, people uh, try to avoid it, right? Because now you feel the pain if you try to use a, a local variable in immutable way, and if you assign it again, whereas otherwise it would be the other way around. So again, this is not a specific bug pattern, but it's more of an enhancement that error-prone brings to your development cycle um, by virtue of being a compiler plugin being, and being able to check this uh, for you. What is also interesting is that um, besides these checks that are being bundled in error-prone, there's also quite a few um, outside sets of checks that you can add to error-prone by adding it to your annotation process path. Uh, that will be automatically picked up and applied by the error prone uh, compiler plugin on your code bases. So for example, uh, the Mokito team has, um, has published a set of checks that will have specific patterns for uh, Mokito usage, where it, uh, where it helps you to find bugs and, and anti-patterns there. Um, there's also one for SLF4J usage, and there's many more for popular libraries in the Java ecosystem. But it does raise the question, right? If those people can make these checks and publish them, can you actually write your own checks with error prone and, and in that way codify your own practices and your own, let's say, uh, rules and patterns? And the answer, of course, is yes. So I'm going to give you a second demo where we are going to look at how to create your own custom uh, error prone check. And for that, I'm going to introduce a second Maven project called My Bug Checker Plugin. And the idea there is that we are going to implement a class called empty method checker. Um, as was already pointed out in the example class that we uh, saw, we had an empty method. 
which in this case we want to flag or maybe even ultimately automatically remove. Um, and for that, we are going to extend the bug checker class uh, in AirProne itself, which already gives us uh, a lot of support to, uh, to implement this. And um, such a bug checker, um, in the end, must be service loadable um, by, the, uh, by the compiler plugin. Um, that means that uh, underneath it uses the service loader mechanism of the JDK to find these checks and, and apply them. Uh, for that, we're going to use the Google Auto Service project, which is another uh, very handy tool to do this with one single annotation, rather than the rather arcane approach of having a separate meta in folder with a specifically named uh, file and a class name in there. So that's going to be uh, pre pretty easy to do that way. But the idea is that once we have this My Bug Checker plugin jar built and available in our local Maven repository, we can easily add it to the annotation process path of our buggy app and see it in action. So let's do that. Let's go to the IDE again. And in this case, I'm in my second Maven project. As you can see, it's called My Bug Checker plugin. And this one, uh, as you can see, itself has not uh, configured uh, uh, error prone because we don't want to go all inception there and check our checks. Uh, but it does have an annotation processor enabled called auto service, which like I said, helps us to with a single uh, annotation, make a class service loadable. And other than that, there's a few dependencies because we are going to code against the error prone API, of course, in this case. So we, uh, we need these as well in our, uh, in our POM file. So what I have here is uh, a skeleton for this, uh, this bug check that we're going to implement. And the first thing that we need to do is say, okay, auto service bug checker dot class. So it is a service loadable class under this type. Done. The next thing that we need to do is use the bug pattern annotation from AeroPro. And we need to give it a name, uh, which is the short ident the identifier, like uh, that exception that we saw before. So this one we call empty method, for example. We need to give it a summary, so we don't like do nothings. There we go. And we need to give it a severity. So let's make this an error because, well, because we can. Um, now we have this uh, match method uh, that we need to implement. So a, a bug checker is actually implemented much like a visitor pattern, or it is actually the visitor pattern that uh, has been implemented here. But we only are interested in matching methods for this check. So we're going to implement this interface, which has a single method called match method, which brings us every method that is found during compilation. So here we need to do our magic. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if the method, the AST of the method, uh, and the body of that method and the statements that are in there is empty, then let's return uh, the fact that we found an empty method. And we are going to match this method tree that was just passed. It could also be that you uh, match a specific subpart of an AST, of course, in a check, but here it's uh, pretty straightforward. And we're going to propose a uh, suggested fix with uh, saying, okay, we want to suggest the deletion of this method to the user of this method tree. There we go. And as you can see, this is all expressed in terms of ASTs, right? So not in terms of lines of codes and, and matching that. So that is something that AeroProne uh, and the whole infrastructure around it will do automatically for us. And if uh, this is not the case, then we will just return a description of no match and everything is fine. Now, of course, there are many caveats. There might be valid reasons for having an empty method, for example, if it has an override annotation, because well, we need to override it, but we don't want to actually do something in the method. Um, you can all uh, implement this, uh, of course, inside of this method, these kind of exceptions. But for now, let's keep it simple and um, do it this way. So we are going to not verify, but install this um, jar file into our local repository so that we can use this bug check in our other project. There we go. So I'm going to go to the pump file here. And besides the error prone core dependency, I'm also going to put our uh, new bug check on the path. So I'm going to copy the coordinates here. Let's take a look at the artifact ID in the version. So there we go. And the other thing I'm going to do, I'm going to add this check that we just created, the empty method one, to the patch checks, right? So what we expect to happen now is that this method will disappear. 
because it ha doesn't have any statements, it will be matched by the, uh, by the bug check that we just have written. All right, so let's see if that's actually the case. Running, so no errors, and we go back to our compiler, and I'm oh, sorry, IDE, and poof, it is gone. It has been rewritten, right? And also, if this were an empty method sp spanning over multiple lines, it would also be deleted. Again, because this is all AST based and not based on actual source lines, etc., as you saw in the implementation of the check. So that is pretty cool. Um, but let's undo this and also show that we can oh, sorry, that we can do this without patching and that we can just use error prone in checking mode as well and get useful information from the check that we uh, just created. So if we do that, then we would expect our build to fail. Bam, and we have a compiler error. That's pretty cool, right? You have your own Java compiler error created by implementing this, uh, this bug check. And it uh, ref refers to this uh, identifier that we just created. It has a summary that we put in the, uh, in the annotation. Um, and it says, uh, did you mean to remove this line? And it points to the uh, right line because, well, that is uh, all uh, standard uh, functionality in uh, inside of uh, compiler error handling and in, inside of IDEs, etc. So, I think this is a pretty, pretty exciting and, and cool tool to apply. There we go. The question is, how do we use this? So, besides just having these stock checks, we also have quite a few custom checks that we implement at Picnic using error prone. There's three categories actually that we have checks for. And the one uh, is, for example, uh, using APIs correctly. So we do a lot with dates and times and uh, for our deliveries, of course, um, and we need to be very mindful of using the right time zones at the right places. So we, for example, have a check um, that, that, that's using error prone checks for this and make sure that we always, uh, for example, uh, rely on an injected clock rather than uh, that we uh, use local date time now, etc., for the current time. It also makes sure that we don't rely on any uh, default time zones and any APIs where we are not specific uh, and, and uh, concrete about the uh, time zone API. And as you can imagine, these kind of patterns, these kind of usages, they have arisen from lots of discussions on pull requests, right? And that's usually how it goes. You see something happening here, left and right, and a couple of times. And then it dawns on you, okay, well, um, if so many people can get this wrong, uh, let's try to write a error prone check uh, for this so that we can automate this and that we can hook this into our CI pipeline and that everyone uh, yeah, gets sort of a level playing field in terms of using these APIs correctly. So that is one category of, of checks that we have at Picnic. Another one is uh, about uh, preventing runtime errors. There are many APIs um, that you can uh, invoke uh, where it looks and it compiles okay, um, but at runtime it will not do the right thing or it will blow up. So, for example, um, if you use SLF4J as a logging facade, then um, you probably know that you can use these curly braces as placeholders for uh, parameters that you can pass to the uh, log statement. But some people uh, uh, inadvertently uh, might use the standard Java pro uh, uh, formatting uh, uh, percent %s in log statements. And this compiles, this runs, it just doesn't give you a count in the, uh, in the log line that is output. So we have a check um, that, that captures this. Um, another one as well, uh, where, where you invoke uh, uh, the log.info, and then the last is a var arc, right? So you can pass any number of arguments there. But if there's a mismatch, if you have two placeholders and just one argument, it will happily uh, uh, um, um, compile, but it will not do the right thing at runtime. So again, we also uh, uh, catch these kind of things using, uh, using checks with error prone. So these are really about uh, preventing uh, misuse of APIs. Then there's also a category which is more about style. And a lot of these things we already capture by having Google Java formatter enabled for all of our builds and having check style. Um, but there's still some things that, that, that slip through the cracks. And for that, we write error prone checks. So for example, if you have uh, annotation syntax where you can write value is one, but if it's just a singular value, then you can also leave off the value is, uh, which we prefer. So we have something that uh, checks that and can rewrite that. Same for having a, s a single value in array types, uh, values in, in, inside of an uh, annotation, where you can put it into array concrete syntax, even have a trailing comma, that's a valid Java, uh, don't ask me why, but uh, we don't like it. So we wanna have you write at mockbean my class in these instances. Again, this is something that we can check using error prone. However, you may have noticed that I've just shown the header of these checks, right? And not the implementation. Why is that? 
because it's quite, I wouldn't say hard, but there's a learning curve to writing these checks, and some of them may be hundreds of lines of code. And you need to know a bit about how to traverse an abstract syntax tree that the compiler emits, um, and especially if you want to rewrite and give good suggestions, then writing a good check can definitely take a bit of time and, and take some effort to, to learn this. So all in all, it's a great tool, super powerful, but it could be a bit user-friendlier. Luckily, we have some options there. So what if, for example, rather than writing such a bug check yourself and, and walking the AST and doing all the checks and then emitting suggestions, what if we could just have a concrete example of a piece of Java code where we say, okay, this is a pattern that we want to match. This is old or this is bad. And an example of how it should be also in concrete Java syntax where we say, okay, this is the new situation. This is good. This is how we want it to be. And then have error prone uh, automatically or magically turn this into something that can run as part of error prone and can check it for you and can apply this, this rewriting. And of course, I wouldn't be saying this if this wasn't possible. So yes, this is possible uh, by combining uh, error prone with refaster. And refaster is an, sort of an extension to error prone to make this possible and to make this easier. So I'm going to show a demo of that as well. And the idea of uh, refaster is that you create a, uh, a class containing uh, templates. So uh, the add before template annotation indicates a piece of code of, how, uh, of what code you want to match. And the after template annotation indicates some code that you want to rewrite to. Um, and by running this through a tool called the refaster resource compiler, you will get a .refaster output file which encodes this kind of transformation, which can then subsequently be used by error prone to apply this to your code base using the same error prone plugin that we already saw. It's also important to know that this, this string is empty template class, even though it's compiled by the compiler, and that's just a side effect. This, this code will not be used, it will not be run. We are interested in creating this .refaster file that can be used uh, to apply to your own Java code bases. So let's move to IntelliJ again to the final project. So this is the my, my refaster template project. Um, here we do have a compiler plugin enabled, but it's a different plugin than the one that we saw in our initial application. It's called the refaster rule compiler plugin. And we configure it to output, in this case, to the uh, empty string.refaster file uh, in uh, uh, directory, directory one level up, so we can easily use it in other projects. Um, and again, we still uh, need to also uh, add a, a dependency that contains this refaster rule compiler to the annotation process path, which in this case is the error-prone uh, refaster artifact. So with that in place, we should be able to write this template. So what we want to do, let me go back to this example, is actually address this, right? Because it is correct code, but nowadays we would prefer to say string dot is empty rather than comparing it to uh, the empty string explicitly, because that is more intentionally re revealing. So what we can do, is we, in this case, we say, okay, we have actually two before templates that we want to rewrite into a single after template. And you see here this very simple piece of code where you say, okay, we want to match code where we have any kind of expression of type string, doesn't need to be a literal, can also be, an, it can also be this array the reference that we just saw. Um, but any kind of, uh, uh, yeah, let's say expression, uh, as long as it's uh, a string, uh, string type, where we then invoke dot equals empty string, or where we invoke dot length and then equals to zero, we want to rewrite this to a uh, after template. So let's add that. And this ent uh, after template contains the, the most straightforward uh, piece of code, of course, which is, again, any expression of type spring, string but now with the dot is empty uh, uh, method call. So that is uh, how we can create a refaster template. And it's super easy, right? So you don't need to know anything about abstract syntax trees, et cetera, et cetera. We just want to uh, write a piece of code before and after. So if we are going to compile this, then ideally as a side effect, we would get this indeed empty string dot refaster file, which we are going to use in our original project to apply it. So there we go. I'm going to reconfigure the 
error prone compi compiler plugin to do patching again. But instead of referring to these uh, bug checks, I'm now going to uh, refer to this refaster file that I just created. This is the empty shrink.refaster file. And again, I'm going to patch in place. So if we now run this build again, then let's move back. Magically, this has been rewritten to dot is empty. And again, it doesn't really matter what was here. Um, as long as this is any expression that is a string, then it would have matched and it would have rewritten this to the is empty here. All right. So can you only do this sort of expression rewriting? Um, no, you can also use templates to actually match a list of statements. So here is an example where we have a, a template where before there's sort of the uh, old way of doing uh, a swap in a list with an intermediate variable, whereas we want to rewrite this, for example, to collections.swap uh, immediately in the after template. So that is also possible using refaster. Um, to give you a few uh, ideas on how to use this, um, we use this, for example, when migrating between Java versions. So when we migrated, for example, to Java 11, um, there were a few enhancements and tweaks to the optional in the stream API. So here's an example of, an, of, a, of a rule that we written and that we applied, where you say, okay, if there's any code that says uh, not optional is present, then as of Java 11, we actually want to rewrite this to optional is empty, which was a new method, um, but yeah, makes it easier and nicer to read. And this is pretty pretty powerful, right? So you don't just migrate to a new version of Java. No, you actually can get to make use of the new APIs there and, and migrate in one go because we have automated this and we have a refaster rule in place that does this for us. Uh, so no more Boy Scout rule and if you see something, then just fix it and, and getting a mix of, uh, let's say, API usage and, and legacy and, and new code. Um, no, using refaster, you can just do this on all these 4 million lines of code that I mentioned that we have. Um, and because we have this uh, centrally and also managed by our platform team uh, in place, um, this is actually uh, something that that we do, that happens, that's that possible, that's uh, in place. Um, just to give you another example, uh, in Java 11, there was also the introduction of the stream method and optional, which makes it very nice to uh, do a flat map on the stream and then uh, map optional stream over it, rather than doing first a filter and then a get. or as you can see, we also used Guava, which had a sort of a workaround for that in the uh, original situation, but we also wanted to rewrite that to the JDK APIs because, well, why not rely on the JDK when you can? Um, so that's another example of where we have a rule. And this also shows that these refresh rules, again, don't just apply to core Java APIs. You can match any API, right? So this is an example of Guava, but we also use, for example, Reactor as a reactive programming library. And there, um, well, as you can imagine, you also over time get some more wisdom and some more insights through many discussions on PRs. Um, and, and there we also have these rules, which allow us to, to rewrite uh, slight anti-patterns into more streamlined usage of the uh, Reactor API. All right, so when would you use re Refaster? Uh, as I said, it's, it's ideally suited when you have a particular uh, a, a set of API applications that you want to re rewrite to a new version. So in the JDK, uh, we saw a few examples. In Reactor, we saw an example. Um, especially if this is a fluent uh, um, uh, invocation, then, uh, then the Refaster template is a very natural way to express this rewriting. But you can also apply this if you have a block of uh, consecutive statements that you want to match. Um, there's no wildcards in there, etc. So it does need to be a, a, an exact match on this list of uh, statements. So there are quite some limitations. But uh, even given those limitations, you can achieve already quite a lot, as I, uh, as I have shown. But we also have the option of doing debug check implementations, as we saw, where we have much more freedom because we can walk the AST, we can look at anything that we want, but there's also more complexity because we, we need to code this uh, traversal. Uh, we need to code the suggested fix, as you saw, which in the uh, instance of the empty method bug check was pretty simple, uh, but it can get quite intricate, of course, if you want to do very complex rewrites and very complex suggestions. So there's a trade-off here. Um, Refaster, very easy to work with, very intuitive, but it does have some limitations in terms of what it matches and what it can do. Uh, whereas these bug checks give you a very, very powerful API, which is great, but also gives you a steep learning curve and uh, yeah, makes it uh, uh, at least something that you uh, need to get a bit proficient in before you can adopt this. 
So when would you create a bug check? And this is actually taken from the error prone site. Um, uh, highly recommend to take a look at their documentation and then read about this. But in the end, these checks, they, they should not be these huge behemoths, all right? So they should be small, easy to understand. Um, all of this boils down to writing checks that makes de a developer happy, right? Where a developer, when he sees the error meshes, thinks, yeah, I actually agree with that. It is better to do it this way. And even better if error prone, if such a bug check can actually do the rewriting for you. So that's something that, uh, that, that you should keep in mind because it's easy to get carried away and try to uh, do too much using this, uh, this, this uh, bug check uh, API. So you might be wondering, so how do we actually integrate this into our way of working and into our CI pipeline? Because I've shown uh, very nice demos of local in-place patching, etc. But of course, that is not how you uh, typically do this. So there's there's several aspects to this. On one, like I said, our platform team is in control of uh, of rolling out these these checks and making sure that everyone is uh, is applying those as part of the Maven builds that we have for our projects. So everyone has the opportunity to run this full suite of tooling locally and make sure that there are no errors uh, in their code. But of course. Problems might still happen, people might forget to do this. So it is also hooked into our CI build and pipeline. And the approach is quite simple, I would say. So for any pull request, uh, if there's uh, a build being kicked off, we run refaster in patching mode. And if after running refaster in patching mode, there's any local changes, so the git, git diff is not empty, then apparently, something is not right. Something has not been uh, uh, taken care of by the developer. So in that case, uh, we use another tool called Danger, which is a Ruby-based tool to uh, easily communicate with GitHub to actually comment on the pull request and say, okay, well, maybe you forgot to run the uh, patch script uh, that is available to you. Um, please do so, fix it. Or maybe you are actually happy with applying this anti-pattern or this bug at this place, and then you need to add an annotation or an exception, uh, or uh, and make an exception in this case, so that the uh, error prone uh, doesn't kick in there. So that is actually uh, something that uh, that is pretty straightforward. Um, and by doing it this way, uh, we have caught many, many errors uh, already. Um, usually, people uh, now do this as a pre. Uh, push hook for, uh, before the push, or, or even as a commit hook, uh, so that they always run the full suite if uh, and before they push it to GitHub. Going a bit further, um, we like this tool so much that we actually also uh, dove a bit into it and extended this, uh, so people in our platform team. Um, use case here is that we have quite a few code bases that are using Rs Java, and like I said, we all are also using Reactor. Um, actually, we want to use Reactor and want to, want to get rid of Rs Java. And error prone is and refaster together are a great tool to do this kind of refactoring at scale, and it really helps us. But there are some limitations if you use refaster. At some point, um, you get to the level where the return type of a method needs to be changed, right? Because you are going from the uh, RxJava API to uh, the Reactor API. And that is not possible using uh, refaster templates, or, or at least it used to be not possible. But with an extension that we, are, uh, that we have developed, um, it is actually possible to do this. And we are in the process of um, uh, streamlining this uh, and actually applying this migration to a lot of code bases that we have at Picnic, which even led to a very nice paper at an academic conference uh, on around uh, developer tooling. So uh, a pretty, pretty cool stuff and also shows how excited we are about this. Um, if you are excited too, then I highly recommend uh, checking out the errorprone.info site. Um, I must be fair with you, we do use a fork at the moment of Aeropro um, because we have quite a few, uh, let's say, uh, ease of life and convenience enhancement that we made to Aeropro, some of which have been accepted in the upstream already, uh, some of which have not been accepted yet. Um, so that is why we currently still run a, a fork, which is very well maintained. Um, so you're welcome to also uh, use this and, and uh, use that one over the stock Aeropro. It will make your life easier if you have a lot of refaster rules that you want to apply and want to manage as we do. Uh, so one shout out, uh, Stefan Schroefers, he's our resident um, um, 
error prone expert, also a part of the uh, project that I pro talked about previously in terms of extending error prone. Uh, so if you have any in-depth issues you want to discuss uh, when you start using this, I recommend reaching out to Stefan. Uh, he's also very eager to uh, to share his knowledge around that. Um, and, and yeah, in that sense, our whole platform team has been really instrumental in, in getting this tooling uh, up and running within Picnic. And like I said, it's not the only tool. We also have the, the standard uh, Sonar Cubes and Check Styles, etc. But this has been really a game changer for us in terms of being able to move quickly on a large scale with 200 plus developers. Um, like I said, uh, moving to Java 11, uh, moving to Java 17 a couple of months after it was out, and not just moving towards the runtime, but also using these new APIs and making sure that you don't leave any technical debt behind. So with that, um, I want to thank you all for joining uh, in this ses session. If you like this stuff, if you think, well, this is cool, um, yeah, feel free to, uh, to come up and uh, reach out and discuss. I would love to work with you in our platform teams. Uh, obviously, we're hiring and we're scaling, not just uh, on the business side, but also on the tech side. Um, but other than that, uh, we do have a few minutes left also for questions now. So uh, I want to give the opportunity for that uh, at the moment as well. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, very nice presentation. Um, so we, we are currently researching a lot of tools in uh, our team to practice our CI-CD pipeline. And I'm curious to know one um, um, improvement that could not be catched by uh, SonarCube or uh, the local um, bug catcher tool that you catch with uh, Error Pro. You catched. Uh, so one thing that, that could have escaped all these checks, mm -hmm. but error prone would have, would have catch it because the empty string equals that, that usually catch by sonar cube also. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I, I think one example uh, and I, I, that was also shown in the uh, presentation is the uh, use of uh, time zones and APIs, um, which is, I mean, relying on the default time zone is not necessarily wrong, but it's wrong in our context because we are a multi-country, multi-time zone uh, company as our hopefully uh, a lot of you as well. Um, where, uh, where using the uh, APIs where you rely on these default time zones is actively harming your ability to, to scale your business to, uh, to, uh, to an international audience. Um, so that is one where we have a few rules where I think, uh, yeah, we would not have uh, been able to do that using, for example, spot bugs or uh, the other ones because the code is not wrong. Uh, it's just not ideal if you're an international company and if you want to cater uh, for people in the right time zones. Um, so that, that's one uh, example that I would mention uh, in this uh, in this area. Uh, and uh, one follow-up question: yeah, sure. uh, Any compile time uh, lags from uh, that you that's observable when introducing uh, error prone? Um, so I would say the the time overhead is not observable. I mean, there's. Probably, if you measure it, there will be, uh, of course, time spent by uh, by error prone. Also depends, of course, on how many checks you have enabled. We we've enabled pretty much most of them, except for the Android ones, and uh, we don't get any uh, appreciable slowdowns from that. Uh, so no, nothing very noticeable. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in my project, I use Lombok and error prone, and mm -hmm. error prone um, often finds things wrong in the code that's generated by Lombok. Uh, so I need to switch it off uh, these error prone checks for the entire class. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you know how I can, how I could selectively switch off error prone for just some methods and fields in the generated code, not the entire class? Uh, would it be possible to get an asterisk warnings on there, or? Uh yeah, I, well, I'm the, so, sorry. So because error prone finds stuff, I need to disable a whole bunch of error prone rules mm -hmm. for the entire class, even though they just show up in one or two generated methods. Mm -hmm. So I write other methods on top and I want error prone to check those, but I have to disable the checks for the entire class. Mm -hmm. So do you know a way around this? Yeah, so the only way I would think is to actually not disable them for the whole class, but put the extra press warnings annotation on the method that contains the offending uh, checks, but I'm not sure if that's possible with Lombok. Uh, I, I'm yeah, not it's not user. because the methods are not, they're generated at runtime, ah, they're okay. not there. There is no method in the source code. The yeah. method is generated okay. like get a set or equal to yeah. string this stuff. Then maybe uh, don't use Lombok. Another reason to not use it. <laughs> no, no. no, I'm just joking, uh, but we, we've, we've um, contemplated using it as well. In the end, we went with uh, immutables, which is a sort of, uh, for at least immutable data classes, a uh, similar alternative, but uh, based on standard 
standard annotation processors with actual generated code that you can influence. So uh, yeah, we, we have not run into this issue. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot be of more help. Uh, just a quick thing about the Lombok. You can uh, set it up so it generates an annotation, and then error-prone will check for the Lombok generated annotation and skip the generated code. So you can selectively, like you don't need to, um, you don't need to exclude everything. It'll automatically just check for the Lombok generated uh, stuff. Okay, well that would be an interesting fix. Yeah. <laughs> okay, one last question. <laughs> All right, you mentioned at some point that you integrate it into your CI, mm -hmm. uh, but isn't it like part of your XML, Palm XML, or is it, is it, isn't it It's like part of your build? Mm -hmm. So how can a developer miss this on their local machine? So if, if it's integrated into your build, mm -hmm. it gives you compile time errors. Can someone miss it or can a project miss it? So are you looking for things that were not included in every project? Or things that a developer did, can you s turn it off, like for your own, only for your machine, and then you can commit this, and you the, the CI will catch it. Th that How is possible, it of course, not recommended. But sure. uh, in the end, uh, we need to have it in CI to be absolutely sure that we don't merge anything that uh, that wouldn't catch it. But of course, indeed, uh, mostly uh, it will be handled locally by developers. And uh, so, usually, how it works is that it, yeah. it runs on your machine. So mm -hmm. when you the changes are made, then you commit these changes along with your own code, right? So yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and locally you would not run it in patching mode. Typically you can, but uh, usually not. Uh, it will just be uh, the checking mode. And uh, if you want to, you can use this patch script that we have, which runs then uh, error prone in patching mode. And then you can use that to uh, to fix up your code if you don't want to do it manually. Okay, so in the code that's in the Git, it's not in patching mode. It's just in checking mode. And then you have another script that runs it in patching mode. Am I, yeah, I yeah get we, this have, we have two modes of operation there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. All right. Then uh, thanks again and uh, have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>